welcome from me, John Denton, to another episode of the Business Ready for Sale podcast series. This episode is a little bit different because it's me appearing on somebody else's podcast and being interviewed on the topic of getting businesses ready for sale, which is something I'm very passionate about in helping business owners to do. And it's great when you're being questioned by somebody else because you don't have to think about what you're going to talk about. You just answer the questions. And so I hope you enjoy this episode. The host of the podcast is Carmen Allen Patali. And Carmen is a content strategist and public relations consultant. She helps businesses stand out with effective marketing strategies. And she is also host of the Committed Creative Podcast, which is what you're going to hear now. And if you want to find out more about Carmen and her services, then she suggests you go to LinkedIn and find her on LinkedIn. So it's Carmen and then Alan, A-L-L-A-N, hyphen P-E-T-A-L-E. So let's go over now to Carmen's Committed Creative Podcast. everyone and welcome back to the Committed Creative Podcast. I'm your host, Carmen Allen Patali. Now we have something a little bit different on the podcast this week because normally I get a creative entrepreneur in to tell us about their business. But this week on the podcast, I'm, I've got an expert in to talk about how you can sell your creative business. So if you have grown your business to a certain point and you're looking to exit, then this is the podcast to listen to. Or if you think that one day in the future, you perhaps want to buy a new business or sell your current business, then this is also the podcast to listen to. I'm interviewing John Denton, who is a business coach specializing in preparing businesses for sale. So without further ado, let's dive into this very knowledgeable podcast on how to sell your business. Hi, John, and welcome to the Committed Creative Podcast. It's so great to have you here with me today. Thanks, Carmen. It's great to be here. Looking forward to this. So the first question I always ask my podcast guests is who they are and what is it they do? So who are you, John, and what is it that you do? Okay. John Denton, I help business owners get their businesses ready for sale. So I've got a couple of um, strands to my business, if you like, helping business owners prepare their businesses ready for sale and helping them to get them sold because two reasons. One, a business is ready for sale is well worth keeping. Because quite often when a business owner has got a business ready for sale, they don't want to sell anymore. Mm. That's why I stop business broking. And, and the other one is I run a business owner group called Business Owners Taking Action, which is a group of business owners that meet once a month for three hours and we work on each other's businesses and get guest speakers along and, and tackle problems and issues. It's um, a forum. There's no competing businesses, so business owners can be very open and honest about what they do and give each, each other feedback. So, again, it's all about growing businesses and, um, yeah, making them saleable. So how did you get into this niche? Because obviously there are business coaches who help just in general with business or, you know, there's marketing coaches and those kinds of niches, but preparing your business for sale is quite a specific niche. How did you get into this uh, line of work? Yes, well, I had a training business for 10 years and it was a registered, became a registered training organization. It was part of a national franchise as well. And Loved the business. I was very passionate about running the workshops and helping uh, my clients out. But it got to the point where after about seven years, I wanted to exit and do something else. And I took on a business partner, someone who had another one of the franchises. We put the two together with the goal of our mantra was exit with equity in three years. So we, we wanted to sell. We had a common goal of selling and moving on and doing something else. So after two and a half, nearly three years, we thought we were ready for sale. We'd built it up. We'd got systems in place and we talked to the franchisor and they were happy for us to sell it and help us sell it. So the franchisor helped us put a price on the business and 
helped us to advertise and get people in. And then we spent uh, six months on a real emotional roller coaster of trying to sell the business. My business partner and I both had sales backgrounds and we thought we could sell it ourselves. Fortunately, it didn't sell. The last people who looked at it went off and bought a Virgin franchise and set up in competition. So at that point, I was about to slip my wrists and or walk away. And a friend of mine who's bought, built and sold a lot of businesses said, no, go and see this business broker in town. If he takes it on, he'll sell it. If he doesn't take it on, it's because he doesn't think it'll sell. So we went and saw this particular broker and we went and saw one of their competitors first. The one we were recommended to looked at the business and he said, you're trying to sell it too cheaply. So he put the value up 25%. So we're talking tens of thousands of dollars here. And, and he took it on and he said, but look, it's a process. You have to go through the process and that will sell the business. Okay, so we went through the process. I did most of the work. My business partner delegated that to me. But then at the end of that process, the business went on the market and it sold and we got the full price for it. And I realized at that point how many business owners, most business owners, in fact, don't have any idea how to put a value on their business and certainly don't understand the sale process and how to go about presenting it for sale. I was going to get into coaching and consulting anyway, so that's when I decided on the niche. You know, because a lot of business owners, particularly now baby boomer business owners, are looking to retire and move on and do something else. And they really don't know how to go about it or where to start. And yes, there's a lot of accountants and coaches out there who, with the best will in the world, are telling them things which may not necessarily be that accurate, like rules of thumb. There are no rules of thumb when it comes to selling a business. So, um, yeah, I mean, and again, every business is different. Having started my coaching business and starting coaching business owners, I spent a lot of time going back to the broker who sold our business and saying, what do you think this business is worth? What do you think that business is worth? And they said, look, just go and do the course at Rewa. They'll teach you how to sell houses. Then you can register with us as a sales rep and we'll teach you how to sell businesses. So then I went business broking, working with them. And they trained me on their process, which I was already familiar with, having gone through it. Sorry, I'm doing a lot of talking here. But... No. Wait, so you trained at Rewa to sell businesses? Back in, well, yeah, a lot of people don't realise, but the law that governs business broking and selling businesses is exactly the same law for selling houses. Oh. So back in those days, when I started, Rewa, you had to do a nine-day course at Rewa to become a registered sales rep to then work under a licensee, as you do in real estate. But you had to do the same thing whether you were selling businesses or houses. But the course didn't include anything to do with selling businesses in those days. I believe they've now changed and they have different courses. So yes, but fortunately the broken firm that I joined who had sold our business um, had a fantastic training set up there and were very good at mentoring and coaching me to sell businesses. Awesome. So in your experience, how long, like you said, it took you about three and a half years to sell your business. In your experience, how long does it take on average, like with the businesses that you work with, to ready their business for sale and get that sale coming through? Yes, we we took three and a half years because we wanted to build it up and make it a lot more valuable. So it really depends how ready the business is right now. And that's my whole point about working with business owners so that if they're looking to sell in six months or three years, then they need to be working on it. And most business owners from my broking experience and more recent experience is that they don't think about it until 
they turn 60 or something and wake up on a Monday morning and think, I'll sell my business now. And then there's a whole lot of preparation, a whole lot of things to do um, before it becomes marketable and saleable or to get the best price. And, yeah, so it's about getting it ready early. Now, some businesses I go to and look at and they're pretty well there because they've got smart owners so they've got systems in place, they've got key people in place and they've separated themselves from the business. The biggest stumbling block to a good business sale most quite often is the owner themselves because they are part of the business or they've got all the relationships with the clients and with the suppliers and things like that. So really a lot of what I do is education, running workshops. I'm launching some online courses next year early 2024 and it's all about getting business owners to think well in advance so really to answer your question it could be anything from six months to three years and particularly with the financials you know one of the key things is having good clean up-to-date financials and if the financials aren't good it can take two or three years to get them sorted out you know so there's a whole lot of things aside from the financials you mentioned systems there and having key people in place what are some other core aspects that business owners need to be considering if they they're wanting to sell within the next few years yeah (laughs) the number one thing is separate themselves from the business and again one of the first things when I'm running my workshops or when I'm answering a call, going to see someone to talk about their business. It's looking at whether they've got a business or a practice. So, and people say, what's the difference? So, well, a business is run on systems and a practice is run on an expert. So if you're a chiropractor and you're the only chiropractor in the business, you've got a practice because it's all based around your expertise. So if you want to sell, you typically would sell to another practitioner and you would sell your database, your client base. So practices can sell and practices can be turned into businesses, but a business runs on systems. So the number one thing for a business owner is systemize your business, get yourself out of the day-to-day operations of the business as much as you can. Because a buyer is going to look at it and say, well, I'm going to have to do what you do. And if they don't have the expertise or they don't have the contacts, then it puts the buyer off. So then there's the financials. Um, They need to be clean, up to date, as little personal stuff or no personal stuff in there as possible. Put everything through the books. Don't run a cash business. I travelled a long way one time to visit a business owner who wanted me to sell their business and they wouldn't send me their financials, which is a bit of a red flag to start with. No, 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 come and have a look at the business first. I said, no, send me your financials first, then I'll come and look at the business because the financials always creates questions. Anyway, it was a referral and in the end I travelled a long way to go and visit this business and had a look around the business and then when I asked for the financials again was told I you realize this is a cash business I said "I, I don't really like what you're telling me so I think you need to find another broker and so I had a coffee and left so you know it's it's putting everything through the books It's illegal not to put cash through the books. Um, And structuring the accounts so that they actually tell you, the owner, what's happening in the business. Because a buyer is going to look at it and they're going to want to see how the business operates and where the profits are, expenses and so on. And the other thing with the financials is, um, particularly with some of the older businesses where they've had a creative accountant you're all into creativity so (laughs) not that kind of creativity (laughs) you've heard of creative accounting I'm sure Um, the 
accountant would have quite often has set them up years ago with a fairly complicated structure to minimise their tax, which is fine for minimising tax, but when it comes to selling the business, it can be a bit of a stumbling block. Um, I can think of a business that was probably worth about $5 million, but it did go, didn't go on the market in the end because the broker just could not understand the financials. Again, it had been set up 20 plus years ago. There was a, an entity set up to employ the people. There was an entity set up to own the assets and equipment in the business. There was another, I think it was a franchise type entity set up for something else. And it was just so complicated. There was money going around within between those entities that when you looked at it, you just couldn't understand how it operated, you know. And so if anything's complex these days, buyers will just walk away. So is it worth hiring an accountant to redo all that structure and change the structure to make it simple so that perhaps you're going to be paying more tax for the next one to three years, but at the end of it, you'll get a higher sale um, price point? Yeah, it's you need a good accountant. You need a good business commercial accountant. And or a lawyer. I've done a podcast with a, a lawyer on business structures because when you're setting up a business or when you're thinking about selling, it's important to have a look at the structure. Some will, you know, it's not all about tax. And I always say, hey, if you're having to pay lots of tax, you've got a good business. So don't be too sad about paying tax. But make sure that when you come to sell, you've got a structure that will be saleable and this, these days because after the royal commission into the finance industry it became very difficult to get finance to buy a business which is one of the reasons i stopped broking a couple of years ago and the problem so what's happened since then is that now more businesses are selling by transitioning so someone will come and buy into a business, get to know the business, and they'll pay it off over a year or two years. So it's a share sale. Mm. So you need to have the right structure set up to enable that to happen. You know, so that's becoming a much more common thing. Five plus years ago, businesses didn't sell that way, small businesses. Uh, but now, because people can't get finance, they're having to do it that way. And vendor finance, which is where the seller basically finances the person into the business, is becoming more popular as well. And what about, like I see a lot of marketing coaches and other businesses where they use their name in in the title of the business. So rather than Red Platypus for me, it would just be Carmen Allen Patali and use my name. Is Does that make a business more difficult to sell if you're using your personal name? I would assume so, but is that yeah. the case? Unless you're a Dick Smith or a Rick Hart. <laughs> <laughs> a well-known name. <laughs> yes, well-known names because those businesses have sold. And uh, But yes, for small businesses, keep the, the name should be indicative of what the business does if possible uh, and not built around a person. No, that's going to put a buyer off. And aside from finances being maybe murky or not super clear or easy to understand... What are some other core challenges that businesses face when they are preparing their own business for sale? Do they struggle to untangle themselves from their business sometimes? Because I know that a lot of business owners, they're so passionate about their business, they want to be heavily involved in everything. Sometimes it can be hard to step back and let someone else take the reins. Is that one of the challenges you see them face? Yes, I mean, that, that's a key one. Is And this is where the systems come in because the better systems you've got, then anyone should be able to come in and run that business. So I helped a business owner for nearly three years get his business ready for sale. This was a, a really nice, um, in the food industry, and really nice business. The guy had started it about 20 years previously, but all the relationships with the suppliers, the clients, were all around him and his expertise as well. 
Uh, he had good food tech expertise. So the first thing when I started working with him was you've got to separate yourself from the business. You need to get someone in to start moving those relationships onto them. And so he, he did. I mean, got a really, really good guy in. And I said, look, if he makes it as an operations manager and gets all the relationships and things going, then make him general manager and then it'll be much easier to bring someone in to buy the business. And over three years, that worked. You know, he got a really good guy. The guy had a lot of good food tech expertise, got to understand all the processes, got to understand the products, the clients, um, and then the suppliers. So people stopped phoning the owner and started phoning him. And that was fantastic. And proof of the pudding was that the person who bought the business had no food tech or food business experience at all. And we're talking about a one point one and a quarter million dollar sale. And it was a share sale as opposed to a, an asset sale. And it went really, really well. And that business is still going really, really well. And that key person that was what is still there. So in that situation, some business owners get nervous. Some buyers get nervous on the basis of, well, if that key person leaves, then what do I do? And so when the sale was set up, that key person staying on, he was offered some incentives to stay on. Um, and it's worked. You know, so there's lots of ways you can structure the thing then to make sure that those key people stay with the business. The things that most buyers are worried about is, are the suppliers going to stay? Are the clients going to stay? Are the key staff going to stay? Mm. And what about when the shoe is on the other foot? When you're looking to purchase a business, what key indicators should you look for to make sure that it's a healthy business that you're purchasing and not, you know, they're not trying to pull the wool over your eyes, so to speak? Yeah, sure. It's a lot of the same, obviously the same things apply. So you should be looking at the financials and the accountants finalised P&Ls and a, an up-to-date balance sheet at some point, not necessarily straight away, but you need to be able to work out what profit the business is generating for the owner before the owner takes any discretionary spending out of it or any interest on loans and things like that which are specific to the owner. So as a broker or an, and as a, a coach now, what I try to do and what business valuers and business brokers do is work out what is the money earning for the business owner before they take anything out of it. So it's called, it's called PBITDA in some um, people's books, or we used to call it adjusted net profit. So to work that out, what you do if you're a buyer, and if, if it's been sold to a broker, this should have been done anyway, you will have copies of the P&Ls, the profit and loss statements, and then you will have a list of what's called addbacks and adjustments. So addbacks are things like the owner's salary, if the salary and super, if they're taking that out of the accounts, not drawings. You can add back any owner's interest on the loans that they may have. If the owners, so like Carmen, if they're driving a Porsche like you, <laughs> you know, and putting that through the business, then you can add most of that back because I might only buy a Suzuki or something. You know what I mean? So all those things need to be sort of normalised. Um, the same with rent, because in a lot of cases now the owners of the business own the property as well, and they may not be paying themselves a market value rent so there needs to be an adjustment there. Or in some cases, they might be paying themselves more than market value rent and paying it into a super fund. So, you know, with buyers, I say, get somebody like me or a really, really good accountant who knows what they're doing to have a look at all those elements of the business. And then it's ask yourself, you know, could I do what the owner does in the business? Um, you know, if if the owner's got to have a 
PhD in cryogenics or something, then it's going to restrict the number of potential buyers. You know, but look at how many hours the owner works in the business and they should be able to tell you that. It should be in the report. Um, look at the systems. Check out the systems. Check out the staff. Stock. Uh, I didn't mention that under the financials, but another key thing, particularly when you're buying a business, is the amount of stock that the business carries. Um, you know, I've seen quite a few businesses when I was broking, and even now, that are they're carrying too much stock. Well, that's dead money sitting on the shelf. Um, and again, you need to look at what the stock level's been over a period of time, because some people will fiddle stock to, how can we put it, be creative with their tax because it affects the profitability on the on the financial returns which affects the tax and so on. So, so there's quite a lot of things to look into and this is where I like to help buyers because if they've never bought a business before, they don't know what questions to ask, they don't know what information they need um, and as I said up front, get profit and loss statements from the accountant, not spreadsheets or handwritten notes or anything like that. You know what I mean? Mm. Because you're going to get someone to do due diligence and they're going to want to match up the P&Ls with the BAS statements and all those sorts of things. And there are probably people listening to this podcast right now who have just started their own business or are thinking about starting a business what are the advantages and disadvantages to starting a business over purchasing one? Like, do you think there are a lot more advantages to purchasing a business rather than starting it from fresh yourself? Really depends upon, obviously, the person's situation and whether they can afford to buy a business. But I would generally recommend buying an existing business, providing you do your homework, you know, look at the client base. What I didn't mention before was that businesses that have only got one or two clients, big clients, are a risk. So be careful about that. If, if, a, if one client is more than 15% of the turnover, it starts to become a negative, it starts to become a risk. Because if that client goes, it's a big chunk out of your turnover. Um, starting a business, yeah, look, other. There's nothing wrong with starting a business. You've started businesses. I've started businesses. Um, and a lot of people get into business by getting into a franchise first. I did that. I was in a franchise. The business we sold was, became part of a franchise. And the good thing about franchises is, typically, they've got good systems in place. They've got branding. They've got marketing. So a lot of the work's been done. And so if you're thinking of getting into a business, but just be aware that if you get into a franchise, you don't own a business. You have a contract to run that business for the franchise or for a term, for a period of time. And they can, if they can find a good excuse, they can get you out of the business at any time. And again, some people think I'm negative on franchises. I'm not. Um, there are a lot of really, really good franchises out there. I say that franchises are a bit like aircraft. You only hear about the ones that crash. Mm. <laughs> There's a lot of others going on really successfully. And it can be a good way to start a business, to get the business experience. What are some of some, like, I guess, going back to that franchise point about, you only hear about the ones that crash. It, crash. Uh, a friend of mine, her parents um, bought a muffin break and lost a lot of money. Um, uh -huh. I guess they didn't buy it. They operated the franchise of it um what are some things to look out for if you do decide to go down that route and purchase a franchise for yourself because i know you know you should be across everything before you dive into a franchise because it can be risky as you've alluded to yes it's like buying any other business you've got to do your homework mm. and um i'm glad you brought that up because i've got a podcast so my podcast is business ready for sale and one of the podcasts I did was with a business broker who specializes in selling franchises. And when I got into broking, because I'd been in a franchise, <laughs> the licensee, the partners, used to send most franchise 
opportunities to me to sell because uh, there's an extra level of difficulty in selling a franchise. But if you're thinking of getting into one, be absolutely aware that you're not going to own anything. You're running a business for somebody else. The other thing is they have to give you a disclosure document. It has to be, it's pretty detailed these days. They keep, the government keeps ramping up to stop people having your friends type of experience. Um, they keep ramping up what has to go into that document. And one of the things that the franchisor has to do is give you, I think it's still 14 days to go through that and get legal advice on the agreement. So absolutely do that. Get a good lawyer and I can recommend some good commercial lawyers to go through the franchise agreement. But in that disclosure document, they have to disclose current and former franchisees with their contact details in. And so you just got to contact some of those people and talk to them about the franchise. And don't just contact current ones, contact some of the former ones um, and why they left and things like that. So it's just doing your own due diligence and being a bit smart, you know. The thing is that, particularly with franchises, people get sold on, oh, I'm going to own my own business, I'm going to own a subway or whatever. And they're sold before anyway, you know what I mean? Um, They're emotionally Mm, sold and they don't do the logical data Mm. type things. And that's, um, I I even have that with some non-franchise businesses where I help a potential buyer. And... I don't tell them yes or no, they should buy it. I give them, present them the facts. I present them questions to ask and then let them make their own decision. But even when I've raised the red flags with them and everything else, they still go ahead and buy it. Mm. And I think, why did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> because they're emotionally sold yeah. on having they love their own. the brand or the business? Is that normally the reason? With franchises, it's usually the brand. Mm. Um, I'm going to own a subway. No, you're not. Um, or I can think of one other case where it was more the product range and things that they loved. It was a, a ladies' fashion business. And it was a husband and wife, and the wife was completely sold on, I want to be selling this stuff. So in spite of all the red flags that I was able to point out to them and the research that they did, they went out and bought it anyway and I think it lasted about 6 or 12 months because my opinion was that the current owners were trying to get out of a lease which is a common reason that some people sell in retail I've just got to get out of this lease Um, and they were moving into state that was their reason they gave the potential buyer oh we're going back to Queensland and everything else, which they may have done, I don't know. But to me, they had a pretty expensive lease. And I, yeah, people just don't do their homework. I said, look, you know, it's a retail shop. The owner was saying, yeah, but we sell quite a lot of stuff online as well. Well, show us in the accounts how much is sold online and how much is sold through the store. They couldn't do that or wouldn't do that. So how can you make a... Informed decision. Informed decision. And if they were selling a lot online, what's to stop them going to Queensland and selling it online from over there? Anyway, I said, look, there's a cafe across on the opposite corner to this shop. Go and sit in there for a couple of hours and see how many people walk in and out of the shop. You know, or offer with the owner, um, I'll come in one weekend and work in the shop for a weekend and get a feel for it. So anyway, they didn't do any of that. And uh, it didn't last very long. It's a shame. So, yeah, so do your homework. And when people approach you for help with preparing their business for sale, what point of the journey are they normally at? Have have they often tried to sell it on their own and struggled and then they come to you? Or is it just a thought in their mind, something they're trying to work towards? Yes, it's across the range, really. I'm working with a, a business at the moment where they're looking at five years down the track. 
And um, so we've set up a five-year plan and then brought it down to, you know, the current quarter and things like that. Then I get the other end of the extreme is I get what I call too late calls where someone calls me up and says, oh, look, someone's been and had a look at my business and they've offered me X for it and we need to, they, they need to make a decision in the next week or two and, and I don't know what to do. I don't know if my business is worth more than that or, or what. That's the too late call. So my marketing and what I'm trying to encourage business owners to do is to come to me early. You know, so <clears throat> so it, it's across the range. The the ones I end up working with typically are the ones who are looking a year or two down the track, and they're the best ones for me to work with because we can make a real difference. We can increase the value of the business. They can increase the value of the business, and they can make it attractive to a buyer. You know, if business owners aren't thinking about it, if they're just stuck in the day to day, then. With a, a year or two or three's effort, they can make it far more valuable and they can make it attractive to a buyer. What you want to end up with is a business where people are knocking on your door saying, oh, I love your business. Have you ever thought of selling? You know, that's where you want to be because then you know you've got a good business and you can ask more for it. And again, when you come to sell, you want multiple buyers just like when you're selling a house. You know, you can get the price up if there's more people looking to buy it. Bidding against each other. Yeah. So tell me more about this group that you formed where you uh, network and mentor other business owners. How did that come about and how long has it been running for? Mm, Well, it came about because, as I said, I had the training business. And when I started the business, I did everything. I did the selling, I did the running the workshops, facilitating the workshops, the assessing and coaching, the whole thing, and then built it up. But I still always kept doing the facilitating. Not all the facilitating, just the programs I wanted to facilitate. Well, I was the business owner, I made the decisions. Um, And so I've always loved that working with a group. And what I learned because of the particular way we ran these programs, it was... The, the people in the course got the material to go away and work on on their own. So it was written it was and it was audio as well. So the workshop session, which was once a week, was to discuss what was in the material and how they could apply it in their particular roles in their business. So when we sold the business, I couldn't stop facilitating groups. And so I just got a bunch of business owners together, non-competing business owners, and the idea was for them to yeah, to facilitate them working on their businesses. And I started that about well, it's probably 14, 15 years ago. And I think three or four of the members are still the same members. Oh, that's <laughs> yeah, I love slow learners. <laughs> <laughs> If you're going to have a training business, you want people who are passionate about learning, got plenty of money and are slow learners. <laughs> <laughs> and in your opinion, is a product-based business easier to sell than a service-based business? Hmm. Or what, what do you think makes one different to the other when it comes to the selling process? Yeah, good question. Probably product-based businesses are easier to sell. If it's a service-based business, who's doing the servicing? You know, if the owner's doing the servicing, well, the buyer's got to be able to do that servicing and they've got to want to put the time into it. So, you know, one of the best businesses in the business owner group I've got at the moment is a product-based business. And the guy works from home, sells online, he buys and holds a lot of stock. That's one of his points of difference is that he delivers from Australia, so he delivers mm-hmm. from Perth, where you go to any of the competitors, they bring it in from overseas, you've got to wait weeks. Um, and there's other things as well. He's an expert in this particular range of products. Are you allowed to say what the product is? Um, yeah, okay. It's microscopes. Oh, 
Interesting. Yeah, and you'd be surprised how many different types of microscopes there are, from very small and hobby type ones up to some very sophisticated ones. So, are they used for in professional, like in labs as well as for hobby? Purposes? Yes, the the guy who's got that business when he first joined the group, and he joined very early on when I started the group, and at that time he was selling laboratory equipment. And he was selling through eBay and stuff, and then he set up his own website and stuff. So eBay has sort of gone down a little bit, but that got him going. <laughs> but one of the things I keep reinforcing to people in the group is get into a niche. And so over a period of time, he decided, well, my most profitable products are the microscopes, and he stopped selling the other stuff. So it became just microscopes. And they sell to, so his markets, and he wouldn't mind me saying this, um, his markets are like vets, um, laboratories, universities, um, and farmers as well. Farmers is an interesting one. Um, so you'd be surprised how big the market is for microscopes in Australia. Wow, so he sells over east as well, not just... Yeah, yeah, nationally, yeah. What are some of the more interesting businesses that you've worked with? I mean, the microscope one is pretty interesting, but are there... But that, right, that's answering your question. It's product-based. Yeah, yeah. And so product bases can be pretty simple. Um, and again, the simpler a business is, the better the business is, in my opinion. Mm. You know... A business partner I had some years ago used to say, simple businesses make money, complex ones don't. Mm. And some people create the most amazing complex businesses and services that they're going to offer. And they're just so complicated they, and they don't make a lot of money. Mm. Some people, particularly in, in tech, create a solution looking for a problem. Mm. Mm. They create something which they think is fantastic and they love it but they haven't checked to see if there's a market for it. You know, so if you're starting a business, don't start a business without doing a lot of market research. Um, but to get back to your question, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> the interesting businesses. Oh, interesting with. businesses, yes. Mm, some fascinating businesses I've sold, like a motorbike wrecking business. Oh, wrecking business. Yeah. Fascinating, eh? The, so they sell the parts? Yeah. So they would buy wrecks, wrecked bikes, strip them, strip them down, put all the parts on shelves. And that business had been going a long, long time. So they've got a lot of parts for old bikes. Mm. And again, you've got these people that collect old bikes or do up old bikes. Mm. And they struggle to get parts. Well, these guys have got parts for just about everything you could imagine. Did they sell the parts online or was it? Online, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's yeah. fascinating. And in... When we were going through selling the business, I made the comment one day, I said, oh, you probably get a lot of wrecks from these hoons going around, you know, smashing up their bikes and everything else. And the owner said, no, no, it's baby boomers. <laughs> <laughs> but going back to their youth, <laughs> buying big bikes and not being able to handle them. So Because the bikes are so much more powerful now and heavier and stuff. He said, and they think that what they did 40 years ago and that, he said, so that's where we get a lot of our wrecks from. <laughs> oh, gosh, I never thought that. But that was an interesting business. I've sold a kebab business, oh. um, auto servicing businesses. Yeah, a whole range. I mean, the principles are the same. It's just the product or service that's different. Mm. So auto servicing businesses are good. Mm. So if there's someone who's listened to this podcast and they're interested in preparing their business for sale, how can they find you? How can they find me? Well, there's the Business Ready for Sale podcast, but if they go to my website, which is johndenton.com.au, pretty easy to remember, then on there, everything they need on there. And what I recommend is I've got a free quiz or scorecard that they can do. It takes It's taking most people between three and four minutes to do it. Just answer the questions on there. It's free answer the questions on there, they'll get a customised report telling them the good points and the bad points and 
some tips on what they can do to make their business more saleable. So it gives them a saleability score. And if they do that, and then they can, again, from my website, they can schedule a call with me for free, and I'll discuss the results with them. And that'll give them, if they do the scorecard first, the, the quiz, um, then I'll have a lot of information. And when we have the call, I'll already have a whole lot of information that I can discuss with them. Mm, excellent. That sounds like a great... Or they can just submit with. a contact me form or stuff like that. So johndenton.com.au. Great. Well, thanks so much, John. This has been a really knowledgeable podcast. And if anyone is looking to buy or sell a business, then I highly recommend that you contact John. Thank you. And thanks for the opportunity. Thank you for listening to the Committed Creative Podcast. I would be ever so appreciative if you could head on over and subscribe to the pod or leave me a review. Or if you're so inclined, head on over to my website, redplatypuscreative.com and send me an email with some feedback. I'm all ears. Until next time, here's to going all in on your creative pursuits. So I hope you enjoyed that episode of Committed Creative Podcast by Carmen Alan Patali. And I hope you got a lot out of it. If you want any more information about getting your business ready for sale, or if you want to do a business saleability score, which is free, um, something free I offer on my website, go to johndenton.com.au and you can find out all about my services there and get a saleability score. Know where you stand now on saleability with your business. And if you want to know more about Carmen, you can find her on LinkedIn, Carmen Allen Patali. That's the surname is A L L A N hyphen P E T A L E. Or go to her website, which is redplatypuscreative.com. That's red as in the color, platypus as in the animal, creative.com. And I look forward to having you on another podcast soon. In the meantime, remember that a business that's ready for sale is well worth keeping. Bye from me, John Denton.